You're looking at a movie still from Guardians of the Galaxy 2014. <clears throat> it marks the beginning of a very interesting scene that I would like to take some time to discuss. The movie's main characters, Gamora and Peter Quill, met only a day or so ago and took an almost instant dislike to each other. But after some shared adventures, including a prison breakout, they're on speaking terms and now they're actually having a conversation. It's the first encounter in which they're not actually fighting, yelling, or worse. Together with the other members of the Guardians team, Peter and Gamora have just escaped from the prison of Kiln. During the escape, something curious happened. When they were finally outside and ready to leave, Peter suddenly walked back into the prison. Just a moment, he said, I'll be back. But he took his time. The other Guardians were getting restless. Rocket Raccoon complained the loudest. It's the moment you've seen in the previous lecture. A rocket was not in a mood to wait around for a human on a death mission. Nor was Gamora, except she discovered that Peter had taken the precious orb with him. Leaving Peter behind meant losing the orb. So she was firm with Rocket. We're not leaving without the orb. Translation, we could so totally leave without him. Yet Peter had good reason to go back. One of the prison guards had confiscated his Walkman, with the awesome mixtape inside it. There's no way he was going to leave the prison without it. Reflecting back on this, Gamora is puzzled. She is a warrior and an assassin, a mercenary, not the most respectable profession in the galaxy. But she is good at her job, if body counts are anything to go by. But what Peter did makes no sense to her. Why would he walk back into the prison, not knowing if he would ever walk out alive again? For that matter, why would anyone risk their lives for that electronic gadget like he was wearing on his belt? But when she asks Peter, it seems to touch a sensitive nerve. Mention of the Walkman brings back a painful memory. At the very beginning of the movie, there was a flashback scene showing Peter as a little boy, barely 10 years old. He was sitting by himself, waiting in a hospital corridor, and listening to the awesome mix on the very same Walkman he had just rescued from the prison guard. Then his grandfather came and walked him into the hospital room. It was time to say the last goodbye to his mother, and the Walkman would prove to be the last thing she had given him. Not long after that day, Peter had lost everything he owned. There was only one thing he still had, the Walkman with the awesome mix. Now this balcony scene with Gamora has the same film music as that flashback at the beginning. It's the track called To the Stars from the film score by Tyler Bates. That is not a coincidence. The track has an association with his mother. In the later lecture we will uh, hear about the reminiscence device as used in 19th century symphonic music. To the Stars is a perfect example of that device. We will hear it a third time at the end of the movie, when Peter reads a still unopened letter from his mother and unwraps her belated gift of a second cassette tape, now containing also Mix Volume 2. That moment I already showed in Lecture 1. What the soundtrack tells us is that Peter's thoughts are on his mother. Maybe Gamora's question triggered these thoughts. But here's the dilemma. He doesn't like to talk about his mother's death. But the only reason he went back to retrieve the Walkman is that it is his last keepsake. So what answer to give? Why indeed risk your life when you can't even say why it's valuable to you? 
you'll see how he handles it. At the very least, it shows his vulnerable side. Earlier that day, Gamora had called Peter, quote, one of the biggest idiots in the galaxy, unquote. But now, the very clumsiness of his answer shows that Peter may not be quite the annoying person she had so tried so hard to shake off. Her next question reveals that Gamora doesn't actually even know what a Walkman is. What do you do with it? she asks. Peter is not in the mood to explain this at circumstantial length. Do? he says. Nothing. You can listen to it, or you can dance. Gamora is already losing interest. I don't dance. Really, says Peter. Time to let her hear the awesome mix. Unbeknownst to the movie audience, and unbeknownst to all of you who have already seen the movie, it so happens that Peter had been listening to Catholic church music from the late 16th century. Counter-Reformation Catholic, to be more precise. So Catholic that you can almost smell the incense. You might call it Peter's guilty pleasure. As he places the headset on Gomorrah, it's these choral sounds that fill her ears. What follows next is a memorable scene. Immediately Gamora is listening with intense focus. The music is clearly unfamiliar, and she doesn't seem to know what to make of it. But that's fair enough. Who would if they hadn't taken Music 103? But after a few more seconds it becomes obvious that the music is affecting her. The melody is pleasant, she says to Peter, perhaps a little too loudly. While listening, wrapped in the crystalline purity of the sounds, the music has another effect on her as well. It's like she is dreaming away to an imagined safe place where for once she might not be needing weapons, and she comes close to doing something she would never consciously allow herself to do. Now it's as if they're both vulnerable. Why would you risk your life for this? Your mother gave it to me. My mom liked sharing with me all the pop songs that she loved growing up. I happened to have it on me when I was... The day that she... No, when I left Earth. What do you do with it? Do? Nothing. You listen to it. Or you can dance. I'm a warrior and an assassin. I do not dance. Really? The melody is pleasant. You might well describe this scene as a tribute to the power of music. Music can bring you in touch with feelings you didn't know you had. It can relax the tough armor of a hardened professional killer. It can take you to long forgotten places and restore the quality of feeling they once had. And without knowing it, it may reveal a desire for comfort and intimacy. Within less than a day, music has managed to establish a connection between Gamora and Peter. But who is the composer who accomplishes all this? His name is Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina, which translates as John Peter Lewis from the town of Palestrina in Italy. For convenience, I will call him simply Palestrina. The particular piece you've been hearing, also mix number 39, is a movement from his Missa Pape Marcelli, or Mass of Pope Marcellus. There is a famous story about that Mass, which I will tell you in the lecture after next, lecture 9. Top right, you see the approximate date, around 1560. So, we've just jumped ahead nearly two centuries. But from the late vantage point that we have now reached, we're not going to reach even further in the f into the future. Rather, we'll be looking back and survey the landscape that we've just traveled. For there is another milestone that calls our attention, one as important as anything we've seen happening in the 14th century.
That milestone is shortly after the year 1400. It concerns something small and seemingly insignificant. A chord. Just three notes. That's it. And yet this particular chord will change history. It will become the cornerstone of all Western music, from the early Renaissance all the way to our own time, 600 years by now. It's called the triad, and along with it comes a sound quality called triadic. The precise technical meanings of these terms will be explained later in the lecture. Now, if after this build-up I play an example of a triad, it's likely that you may be a touch disappointed. This chord marked a milestone, around the year 1400. But what was new about it? We've been hearing it all the time in the awesome mix, and nobody made a big deal about it then. To which I can only say, you are totally right. Triads were well known before about 1400, and they can be very often heard in polyphony from around that time. So we're not talking about their invention. They existed, all right. And yet, there had always been a problem with triads. The problem is that they didn't sound good. There was something off about them. The sounds didn't blend well. They were not at all like those pure octaves, fifths and fourths that stood like a fortress wherever you used them in polyphony. Those were intervals that could end a cadence. They brought perfection. Indeed, they were perfection. But the triad was not like that. It was imperfect. By definition, in fact, for the triad contains the interval of a third, and a third is an imperfect interval. Remember those experiments we did on the monochord? The major third has a ratio of 81 to 64. Compare that to the octave, 2 to 1, or to the fifth, 3 to 2, or the fourth, 4 to 3. These letter sonorities are so simple and so harmonious that they must be near the top rung of the ladder of creation, nearest to the undivided self that is God. On the other hand, the more you break up things into smaller pieces or into smaller fractions, the more imperfect they will be, and the more remote will be their likeness to the divine creator. The rightful place for such imperfect things is lower down the ladder. That was true of the interval of the major third. True also, by the way, of the minor third, and true of the triad, which contained both. Fortunately, being imperfect, like the triad or third or sixth, doesn't mean that there is no place for you in music. Yet the place is a subordinate one. In the cadence, for example, the first chord, the imperfect one, has no role to play other than give way to the second chord, which is the final and perfect one. That was the subservient role a triad was allowed to play in the 14th century. So what I said a moment ago is true enough. Triads and triadic sonorities were indeed well known, and indeed they could be heard often. But in the musical idiom of the time, they were second-class citizens. And it's in this respect that a major change would come about not long after the year 1400. At the root of it all, there must have been a simple change in taste. It's like moldy food is disgusting until somebody comes along and discovers blue cheese. The rest is history. Well, somebody came along and heard something of value in the triad. And then came the realization. Perhaps the triad doesn't always have to step aside and yield the spotlight to perfect intervals. Perhaps you could even end the cadence with a triad. An outrageous proposition, of course. One that goes against reason and common sense. Yet we're not talking about reason and sense, we're talking about taste. And if we know anything about taste, it is that it can be utterly perverse. So while the triads sounded harsh around 1400, you could develop a taste for them. And people began in to hear in them the inklings of a new and exciting musical quality. They called it sweetness. It wasn't there yet in its purest form. But perhaps there might be a way of polishing up triads, giving them a little gloss, adjusting the settings, as it were. Although there is virtually no scope in this course to dwell on that, the way to do it was by tuning them differently. Once triads began to sound like the perfect sonorities they actually weren't, it was as if the floodgates had opened. The sweetness of triadic sound began to pervade all polyphonic music. The music of Palestrina that you heard in the video clip, it is drenched in the sweetness of triadic sound.
People at the time described such sweetness as incomprehensible, divine, heavenly, miraculous, bewitching, and many more such epithets. It was the most wondrous thing that could be heard this side of heaven. Now this is where the great contribution of the Renaissance lay, not in inventing the triad, but in making it usable. Once you've heard that wonder, you don't want to go back. One major writer on music, Johannes Tinctoris, made a name for himself when he declared around 1470 that music older than 40 years was not worth hearing, and he specifically had sweetness in mind. This is the story of the present lecture. Its title is Sweet Savor. Savor is the taste of something. To savor something is like tasting, except you want to hold on to the taste. You want to make it last a little longer. There is no better metaphor to describe what Renaissance composers did with sweetness in their music than savor. Yet, before we embark on this story, there is still some unfinished business to attend to. How did that scene with Peter and Gamora end? As I explained in the previous lecture, unfinished business means imperfection. Obviously, we don't want imperfection. Nor is there any reason why we should leave the scene imperfect. As a matter of fact, it seemed like they were about to kiss. That would mean the ultimate closure, sealed with a kiss, to quote the 60s song, and thus perfection. Let's go back to that moment and see what happens next. No! Oh, what the hell? I know who you are, Peter Quill, and I am not some starry-eyed wait here to succumb to your, your pelvic sorcery! Happening. No. Gamora still pays tribute to the power of music, except this time by calling it sorcery. Yes, it can be that powerful. I don't know why she calls that sorcery pelvic, though. What does the pelvis have to do with anything in this scene? I can only imagine it's because the Walkman is, in a way, the instrument of his sorcery and he wears it on his hip bone, which is part of the pelvis. There is only another, there's also another possibility, which I mention only because it is so unlikely to have crossed your mind. It's pelvic in the sense of pelvic thrusting. If it had crossed your mind, you might well have rejected it out of hand. I can think of at least three reasons. First, there is nothing magical or sorcerous about such instinctual movements, especially when one is engaged in genteel conversation. The film score reminds us that Peter Quill is thinking of his mother all throughout the scene. The thought of trying his luck with a professional assassin seems absurdly incongruous. The only thing that visibly works magic on Gamora is the music coming from the Walkman. It's the crystalline stratospheric sound of Palestrina. Even so, I've seen a Reddit discussion in which everybody took us as self-evident that Peter was thinking with his pistolino. What is it with people? If it seems somewhat irreverent to drag a Renaissance composer into the Marvel Universe, I can tell you that Palestrina is no stranger to Hollywood. There is a certain type of thematic content for which nothing but Palestrina's music will do. I am thinking especially of one movie I once saw. It depicts the anxiety and depression of two guys in their twenties who have come to realize they accomplished nothing in the few years since graduating from college. One of them is in a bad marriage, in fact, and he feels trapped in the lousy job he settled for. It seems like life is about to pass him by if it hasn't already. All this has made him so insecure his manhood that his wife can actually goad him into robbing a bank. Unfortunately, he is lousy at this job as well, and he somehow manages to shoot and kill his own friend. Oh yes, I'd forgotten to mention those additional ingredients. Guns, drugs, cigarettes and liquor. Nothing in this movie was left to chance. Which brings us to Palestrina. The movie is called Promised Land. It came out in 1987 and presented itself as a daring and unflinching portrayal of the existential misery that comes after graduation, sketched on the dark palettes of a gritty social realism. You cannot picture this without the sacred choral sounds of Palestrina holding it all together. Look at the following trailer where those sounds blend seamlessly into a dazzling visual collage of the other side of the American dream. You all right? They're gonna love you. 
David, there are so many things that I want to do. Ma, this is my wife. Oh, I can't do them here. Now, if we go, I think we should go in style. Don't you? For Kiefer Sutherland. Some people, they just seem to know exactly where they're going. Meg Ryan. You dragged me out here, and now you're saying, I don't know what you're saying. Tracy Pollan. Wish I didn't have to grow up. And Jason Gedrick. So come back here, you don't have to. The road ahead seems to lead back home. Back to the promised land. Freeze! Wait! Davey! Promised land. Life on the edge of the American dream. Palestrina is a composer of such immense importance and influence in Western music that I will have to come back to him in the next two lectures as well. Here's the relevant page spread from your textbook. The first point to make about Palestrina is that his music is the embodiment of an ideal. It stood out as a beacon visible to all subsequent centuries. The particular ideal is that of a counterpoint with such purity of sound, such cleanness of part writing, such absence of even the tiniest irregularities, and above all such perfect calibration of sweet sonorities that it seems not of this world. Palestrina is the embodiment of that ideal also in that he has inspired a long teaching tradition, stretching all the way to our own time. The most famous method of Palestrina-style counterpoint was that of the 18th century composer Johann Josef Fuchs. He lived about a century and a half after Palestrina, and so he had no direct idea of the composer's own teaching methods. But he was thoroughly steeped in the style, and for his own teaching he began to work out simple baby steps to teach his choir boys. That requires a didactic mind. Fuchs devised a method involving six species of increasing difficulty. Baby steps is a good word, for Fuchs presented his curriculum as an arduous path that may lead to great heights, but can only be traveled one step at a time. His counterpoint method is famously called Gradus at Parnassum, Steps to Parnassus. Mount Parnassus is where the Muses were reputed to live. So a method that can make you worthy of dwelling among the Muses must surely be a good thing. It would be a fair guess that pretty much all musicians and composers since the early 18th century were reared with the method of Fuchs. But for all the lofty heights of that grandiose mountain, here is where the basic steps begin. And to have some kind of idea what those steps were like, let's open our Gradus at Parnassum and find out from Dr. Fuchs directly. This is one of those historical documents that are cast in the form of a dialogue. Those are my favorites. In such dialogues, the students are invariably humble, respectful, deferential, eager to learn, hardworking, dedicated and full of curiosity. Their masses, on the other hand, are of the opinion that life is no joke. This is no laughing matter and should not be taken lightly. So the teacher sees it as his first responsibility to impress upon students the immensity and enormity of the labors which they have so frivolously decided to undertake. We'll start with the first dialogue shown here. It's in Latin, and that is because the kinds of schoolboys who would take counterpoint were already fluent in Latin. In this particular dialogue, the student is called Josephus. I imagine him as a timid little boy, and I'm now going to invent a little story to get us into the dialogue. Josephus has been given the address of a big residential house in the center of Vienna, where lives the world-renowned Dr. Aloysius, a man of immense learning in the musical arts. Josephus knocks on the door and waits. A servant in livery opens and leads him directly to the library. For the next ten minutes, could also be eleven, he is left sitting there all by himself. Then the door swings open, and Dr. Aloysius steps in, a towering figure of a man with a frown permanently etched in his forehead, and a demeanor that says, 
I am busy. Dr. Aloysius was not expecting visitors, and the little boy waiting there is an unwelcome sight. He looks at the boy and says, And who might you be? I come to you, Venerable Master, in order to be introduced to the rules and principles of music. You want then to learn the art of composition? Yes. But are you not aware that this study is like an immense ocean, not to be exhausted even in the lifetime of a Nestor? You are indeed taking on yourself a heavy task, a burden greater than Edna. If it is by in any case most difficult to choose a life work, since upon the choice, whether it be right or wrong, will depend the good or bad fortune of the rest of one's life, how much care and foresight must he who would enter upon this art employ before he dares to decide? For musicians and poets, they are born for art. You, on the other hand, must try to remember whether even in childhood you felt a strong natural inclination to this art, and whether you were deeply moved by the beauty of concords. Yes, most deeply. Even before I could reason, I was overcome by the force of this strange enthusiasm, and I turned all my thoughts and feelings to music. And now the burning desire to understand it possesses me, drives me, almost against my will and day and night lovely melodies seem to sound around me. Therefore I think I no longer have reason to doubt my inclination, nor do the difficulties of the work discourage me, and I hope that with the help of good health I shall be able to master it. I think, I think that sets the tone. After some more of these exchanges, which eventually soften the old man's heart, it is time to sit by the piano and start with the rudiments of the contrapuntal art. The first lesson starts on the right-hand page you see there. Master Aloysius begins the same way that every counterpoint teacher has begun from the early 14th century to the present day. He begins with a melody in whole notes. He calls that melody the Cantus Firmus. This is the basis for all counterpoint. It is called Firmus because you're not allowed to make any changes to it. It's literally firm. No matter how complicated a contrapuntal problem may be, do not be tempted into changing the cantus firmus. It's against the rule. This particular rule goes back to the time when the cantus firmus was always a plain chant, and plain chant is in principle unalterable, like scripture is. So, there it is, our cantus firmus. And now Dr. Aloysius will graciously condescend to play it for us on the piano. Dr. Aloysius goes on to explain that the art of counterpoint lies in composing a voice against it. At this early stage of the curriculum, that voice will also move in whole tones. So the result should be note against note, or point against point. And here is the same counterpoint essay in modern notation. It may look like a trivially simple exercise. But actually, the basic array of counterpoint rules is already in operation here. There's things you cannot do. There's things you must do. Things you're encouraged to do. Things you should do only by rare exception. Things you can only do if you do some other thing as well. And so on and so forth. You could compare it to your first day learning a new sport. You're being told the rules. You must practice them. And the idea is that they will eventually become second nature. In the same way, our student Josephus will now be sent to his home with a stack of papers containing nothing but exercises, exercises, and exercises. And that, ladies and gentlemen, has been his first step to Parnassus.
now we're going to move back to the 16th century once again and consider these same issues that Fuchs discussed, but now in an item from the awesome mix. It is number 36, the motet Dum Transisset Sabbatum by the English composer John Taverner, composed almost exactly five centuries ago. So John Taverner, who was he? Unfortunately, we have no idea what he looked like. English composers typically didn't have their portraits painted, partly because they didn't think of their work as important. But, looks, it looks, but look at this musical source for one of his works. The initial letter E has been greatly enlarged, so much so that you can fit an entire head into it. In this case, it is the somewhat oversized head of a strong-jawed man from whose mouth issues a scroll with the following solemn words. John Taverner. I don't know that individuals typically self-identified with speech balloons at this time, but therein lies our only hope if we want to know what he looked like. However, any interest in Taverner's visual appearance soon dwindles when we turn to the music. The motet by John Taverner is based on a plain chant that has the same title, Dum Transisset Sabbatum, when Sabbath had passed. When he went to work on his new motet, Taverner began by copying the melody from a chant book like this and writing it down at the bottom of his score. Here is that particular chant melody. This chant was actually sung on Easter Sunday, the day on which Christ's resurrection is celebrated each year. The text comes straight from the Gospel of St. Mark. It narrates the story of the three Marys, who woke up early after Sabbath had passed, gathered up the spices they had bought the day before, and went out to the sepulchre to anoint, to anoint the body of Jesus. A sorrowful task, but also the last act of kindness you can extend. Strangely enough, the text is open-ended. There's nothing happening. Let me read it for you. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus, James and Salome had bought sweet spices, that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. Every Christian believer knew what text came after this in St. Mark's Gospel. It's about the stone having been rolled away, the angel sitting by the sepulchre the good news he reveals and his exhortation to spread that news to others. Nobody needed the motet to tell them that, which is why the chant could afford to leave all this unsaid as well. For me, the beauty of the text lies precisely in the fact that it leaves all that unsaid. It's like looking down on the three Marys from above as they walk, innocent as yet of what is about to happen. We, the audience, do know what will happen, and that knowledge colors the scene whether we like it or not. Yet this plain chant, and the motet based on it, wants to stay in that moment of innocence for just a little while longer. And that choice colors the scene in a different way. Now let's listen to the beginning of the chant. <laughs> Once John Taverner had taken the Cantus Firmus from his chant book, he treated it in exactly the same way as Fuchs had done in his textbook, as a string of whole notes, all equal in duration. Yet he gives him himself much greater flexibility in the other voice parts. He uses shorter as well as longer notes, introduces irregular rhythms, goes silent for stretches, and takes away some of the ponderous formality of first species counterpoint. It is a beautifully fluent composition. But in the midst of all this, the original Cantus Firmus keeps walking its own steady path, 
always those same perfectly steady whole notes, like the tolling of church bells. Unfortunately, this is not always easy to hear, for the motet is almost an overwhelming outpouring of sweetness. But in the following example, I've mixed in a piano rendering of the Cantus Firmus, so that you can actually hear it, note by note. In its treatment of the Cantus Firmus, Taberner's Motet is as old-fashioned as it gets. But the handling of musical space is truly magnificent and brand new. Five voice parts, each in its own range, spreading out across the full spectrum of three octaves. You see the significance of it here in this table. His motet is number 36, the second piece after the year 1500. A thumbnail of the composer's image is placed right above it. The wide span of the motet is virtually unprecedented. It would have been completely beyond the imagination of the composers whose works we enjoyed only a week or two ago. To control the sound space of this scope is both a technical challenge and an artistic one. Let's take a moment to appreciate the way Taverner met that challenge. Since this is the 21st century, one minute is all that we can spare for it in this lecture. Such are the times we live in. But for the duration even of this sample, let's give it at least a little space to breathe. Let's go back to our time chart. We started with Palestrina near the end of the Renaissance. Then we went back to John Taverner about 30 years previously. Between them, the sound was not all that much different. But if you compare it to where we were only last week and bring Masho into the same picture, it's obvious that the world of sweetness, of triads and triadic sonorities, is a completely new one. 
But now that we have stepped across the threshold, let's stay within the after, 14 period, after 1400 period, the Renaissance. We moved backward from Palestrina to Tavener, and we'll take another jump back to awesome mix number 31. The composer is Guillaume Dufay. He is the central figure of the entire 15th century, in the same way that Marshall was of the 14th. But if you listen to his music, you can tell that he too is already well past the threshold of sweetness. Take a listen. You'll hear none of the crunchy dissonances of Marsho, none of the syncopations and offbeat rhythms, none of the constant sharps that gave Marsho's music its weird 14th century chromatic flavor. This is the brave new world of the Renaissance. <laughs> This new musical sensibility for sweetness spreads also into the sphere of popular song and courtly love songs. Songs of this type were collected in precious little books called chansonniers. They were expensive, made of parchment, copied by professional musicians and decorated by professional art artists. They weren't really intended for everyday practice. But if you were a suitor to a young lady and paid her courtship, and if she entertained the effect affections of several suitors, then a manuscript like this was a fine gift to pre present. We have an example of such a song in awesome mix item 29. Again, it's a work by Dufay, the French courtly song Cela Face Pal. You can see it here in another chansonnier, one that has become memorable because the artist who painted these lovely colorful initials appears to have had an obsession with snails. There's scarcely an image in this manuscript, or it turns out that a snail is somehow involved. But now let's listen to that song, Sur la face et pal. And note again how far we have traveled from the 14th century. The music is gentle, lyrical. It avoids extremes of tempo, rhythm, rhythm or dissonance. And it too exudes that elusive magical new quality that is called sweetness. So But now let's step away from sweetness as a general term and look at triads in a more strictly technical sense. The first thing to say about triads is that they are examples of what is called tertian harmony or tertiary harmony. The word three is in both these terms, and that is because thirds have now become the essential building blocks of all chords until well into the 20th century. Not fifths, not fourths, not octaves. No, it's that lowly third, that little imperfect sonority despised by its perfect siblings, that now becomes the very brick and mortar of Western music. In tertian harmony, all chords are built 
by stacking thirds on top of one another. The triad is the first and simplest example of this. Here you see the two thirds that make up a triad. The first is a major third, the second a minor. Put them together and you get a major triad. Now we do the same, but we start with a minor third and stack a major third on top of it. The result, a minor triad. This is one way to look at the triad, and also at more complex chords, as the accumulation of thirds. But you can also conceive the triad in a different way, as the conflation of intervals. The first interval in that case would be a unison. In the example here it gives us the pitch G, and that pitch is called the root of the triad. All right. The root, that much already tells us that triads can be uprooted, but more about that later. The second interval is the third. It gives us the middle note, B. And after that comes the perfect fifth, which gives us the D. One important thing about triads is that you're not stuck to one particular group of pitches. Suppose you're composing a work for orchestra and you want to write a triad for an instrument somewhere in the high range. It sounds great, but it needs more. We want a richer sound. Well, we have an entire orchestra at our disposal, so let's throw in some more instruments. Great idea, and yet we quickly run into a problem. All the instruments are capable of playing some G or B or D, but not all in the same range. That would be a problem if you insisted that these three particular pitches make up the triad you want, and all other pitches would create a different chord. In that case you could still create a rich and harmonious uh, sonority, but you'd have to pretend that it was merely a combination of triads in different ranges. You could never say, can I hear that chord again, because people would want you to identify the particular triad first. But here, these are all the same tri triad. We take the lowest note of the first one and move it down an octave, and we still have a variation of the same chord. Another uh, octave leap down. Now let's take the highest note and move it down an octave two. No problem at all. And we can keep going, and in a certain sense we can call them all the same chord, despite the shifting around of pitches, like so. Yet, in order to call them the same, there is one thing they must have in common. The root G must always be the lowest note. Not D ever, not B, but only G. When the root is in the lowest position, then the whole chord is said to be in root position. Now that we've explained these basics, let's take one last look back at the age that treated triads as ugly, imperfect things. If you were to ask today what is a better sound, a fifth or a triad, uh, most people would probably say a triad. For when you compare them so directly, the fifth alone sounds bare, a bit cold and elementary. But the triad has this nice third in the middle and that makes it fuller and richer. That's what we've been used to since the beginning of the Renaissance. But now go back to the 14th century, and they would say, no, the fifth is purer, it's cleaner. It's like water in a glass. The fifth is crystal clear water, but with a third mixed in, it's not so perfect anymore. It's like there's a tiny speck of milk that fell in the water. Just imagine, you wouldn't serve that in a restaurant, would you? On the other hand, if you add an octave to the fifth, you would still have that same crystal clear purity. And of course, people had the mathematics to prove it. Look at those chords marked P and those marked I. Perfect, imperfect. Look at the beauty of those simple mathematical fractions. That is purity for you. 
And so they might well say to us, that sweetness of yours, that is exactly the impurity that vanishes when we play a cadence. In fact, we in the 14th century are in such a hurry to make it to the perfect chord that we've created shops to get there faster. Their way of thinking, that sensibility for rugged, bare, granite sounds disappeared in the 15th century. But it would return in the 20th. I have already mentioned the example of Roy Harris. We've traveled a long path since we first heard his glorious third symphony. That was when we were still listening to Organum around the year 1000. Now listen to that same symphony by Harris again. But back to the sweetness of the Renaissance. There is an important difference between sweetness and consonance. Sweetness is a richer quality than just consonance alone. A fifth is a consonance, and it is a perfect one. But if I strike a fifth at the very bottom of the keyboard range, it's not going to be sweet sounding. And if you strike it at the very top range, you scarcely hear anything at all. That already tells you that the subjective quality of sweetness is something fluid. It is contingent upon many things that are within the control of the composer and even more so of the performer. And it requires the most delicate ear both to craft and polish that sound quality in it and to savor it. This is where the art of counterpoint comes in. The very first steps to Parnassus were simple. But Dr. Aloysius was right when he said, in so many words, that there are no last steps. There cannot be. For sweetness is a kind of perfection. You can never fully reach. To illustrate the fluidity of sweetness, let me go back to an expression I used at the beginning of this lecture. I spoke not only of triads, but also of triadic sonorities. What did I mean by that? It means that the kind of sweetness cultivated in the Renaissance could be achieved with more types of chords than just a triad in the strict sense. A triad in the strict sense is one in root position like the first chord in this example. G is the root here. When we say that thirds are stacked on top of one another, then the note that ultimately sustains them all is the root. When the root is actually the lowest note, then we speak of a triad in root position. Yet there are other triadic sonorities as well. You get them by a process of inversion. Take the lowest note of the three, place it at the top, and now you have that same triad, except it's uprooted. Here is what it sounds like. And this is just the first of two possible inversions. The second takes the same process a step further. So in fact you could say that there are three triadic sonorities. You don't have to be singing root position triads all the time. And by varying things a little, you can main maintain sweetness without risking monotony. 
Now let's go back to that passage from Palestrina that so moved Gamora in that special moment with Peter. In this and several future examples, I will use a pink shading for all passages that have triadic sonority. You can tell immediately that Palestrina doesn't lose any time getting to a rich and full-bodied triadic sound. It may not be pelvic sorcery, but sure it is uh, making magic. And it is in crafting these sonorities that Palestrina passes the threshold between the arts of counterpoint and that of composition. And so this story is best continued in the next lecture, which is called The Art of Composition. <laughs>